Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center and welcome to Knife AQ episode 134, the knife series where I answer all your questions sharp or dull. This week we're taking a look at some big and fun knives and also exploring the question who does the best or the sharpest knives straight from the factory. Let's get into it. All right, if you're new to this series, the deal is we answer questions that are left in the comments section below these FAQ videos. So if you've got a question and you would like us to consider it for a future episode, please, I invite you to leave it down below. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You guys are the lifeblood of this series after all. First question today comes from John Taylor. Hey DCA and crew, I am an intermediate collector with plus or minus 40 pieces in my collection. I have one primary complaint about them all. Factory edges are generally dull, toothy, or uneven. I'm not skilled at sharpening and don't really feel like trying right out of the box. I want your opinion on sharpest factory edges. No need to name check those manufacturers who aren't known for great edges. Just would like thoughts on companies or models with worry-free cutting on day one. Thanks and keep up the great content. Thank you, sir. Well, let me, uh, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. And um, speaking of skill at sharpening, uh, especially as you, you know, get more into the subject, that's something I think anyone who, you know, collects and uses their knives should know how to do. But we all start somewhere after all, um, you know, I wasn't always particularly skilled myself either. But I would encourage you to, you know, practice that. Um, you can check out our uh, playlists on the subject. We'll leave a link to it either up here or in the description. Up there. Thomas is pointing up here, so it should be right there. Uh, so you can check out that for some pointers, and I hope that helps. Um, but putting that aside, factory edges. The, I think the biggest thing that differentiates factory edges versus what you can do at home, I used to say, you know, there's, there was never a factory edge I couldn't improve. That's because I've got more time to spend on an edge than a mass production environment will allow for factory edges. That's why you'll see things that aren't as refined. And that, that I think is the key differentiation, refinement of the edge. You can still get something that's plenty sharp. You just might wish it was taken to a, a higher grit or something to that effect. There are companies that do some, or that do spend more time on their edges, however. And these aren't the only examples of, you know, companies that do, do spend that extra time, but they're kind of my go-to examples at three different price points. I'll talk about those. And I encourage you folks to uh, chime in in the comments too. What are your best factory edge experiences out there? Let us know. On the budget side of things, or the, the more, affordably priced side of things. I've got to give it to Civivi and Sencut, same company right there. Their factory edges are superb for a couple of reasons. One, they do seem to spend a little extra time on the edges and it's going to be hard to show on camera, but we'll try to get as close up as we can uh, of a shot on the blades here. The edges are highly refined. They don't appear to have very much in the way of visible scratch pattern at all. And often, not, not always, but often, Civivi knives come with hollow grinds, meaning the edge is thin behind, or the uh, geometry is thin behind the edge, and they grind them very thin to boot. So you've got a very thin, very highly refined edge that are just laser-like out of the box, all the ones I have experienced. This one right here is uh, the Knife Center exclusive version of the Badlands Vagabond. It is a little more expensive. Uh, comes in at about $80 or $79.50 right now with an S35VN steel blade. But these start around $40 for the, uh, the 9CR, I believe, uh, stainless steel versions. And you're gonna get the same type of edge characteristic there, just with an easier to sharpen steel and something easier to uh, keep at that highly refined state. What they're doing in the, uh, in the budget space is truly, truly impressive. So moving up from the uh, budget area to the more kind of mid-range mid priced product, Hogue has always done consistently a very, very good job with their factory edges. Uh, this right here is a Knife Center exclusive MagnaCut bladed Deca 
Price on this about 166 and some change. Uh, you can start getting into some Hogue knives a little bit over the, uh, the $100 mark and up from there. But they're really nicely done. As you can see from the edge, very, from the, the shot, hopefully very highly refined. Actually, you get a convex edge too. This is not just a, uh, a flat V edge itself, which I find is easier to maintain, a little easier to strop, thanks to that slight convex convexavity, convexiness. That's a word, right? It is now. It is now. Um, and also it tends to be, you know, maybe just a little bit tougher than just a straight V bevel as well. While I'm holding the knife on this side, note this name right here, Alishowitz, which is of course, Alan Alishowitz, the designer of this knife. The reason that Hogue does what they do, spends the extra time that they do is Alan actually has a huge stamp on Hogue's lineup for the first, you know, almost 10 years, at least almost all of their knives were designed by Alan and he helped them kind of get stuff going in a way with the, with his designs. And also, as I've heard told to me uh, by some Hogue folks, he taught their factory people how to sharpen the way he does. So the way a custom maker sharpens his knives, his custom knives, Hogue is trying to replicate that in a factory setting. That's very, very good stuff as far as I'm concerned. And stepping up into the true premium production realm, Chris Reeve. Their knives tend to be exceptionally well done, similarly to the Hogue. But check out the edge on this Inkosi right here. Not this Tonto portion uh, at the front. You can see there are some uh, vis visible scratch lines there, but that's not the actual sharpened edge portion. It gets sharpened there right at the apex, and you've got a very nicely refined edge on those. Very, very cool stuff. As mentioned, there are you know more companies doing great stuff like this, uh, stuff at higher price ranges than this $500 Chris Reeve too, but I, I always kind of take note of, uh, of what these companies have been able to achieve with their factory edges. They really care about what you're getting and they care enough to spend a little extra time to get it just right, which is pretty cool. All right, next question comes from Christopher Williams, 5202. Hey, DCA and Thomas. What's up? Love the channel. Question, I retired from the US Navy, but still work on the base now in an office. I am tired of tactical and especially tactical. What is the least tactical knife you would recommend with a $100 budget? I want it to be loud and fun with a four inch blade limit. I like this question because it, kind of reminds us that knives are fun. Sometimes, and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, we as kind of knife nerds, knife people tend to take ourselves a little too seriously sometimes. And maybe even the gear we carry, we take it a little too seriously. I'm guilty of it, I'm, I'll cop to that. But let's, let's have fun with these choices, shall we? Uh, I'll start with the, the most mundane option here. Uh, the, the most kind of, kind of the easy practical answer, but we'll move on from that quickly. And that would be something like the Spyderco Endura. Three and three quarter inch blade, full flat ground, VG10. Uh, FRN handles comes in about 95, 96 bucks and available in a bunch of colors. Loud and fun, like this bright blaze style orange right here, but it's still just a great, utilitarian, useful blade, useful pocket knife with great blade geometry. So that might be a little too boring, maybe not quite as fun, but certainly an excellent choice for utility. So let's, let's move on from that. But I had to throw kind of like the, the, the practical choice in there, even if just for a minute. Let's say least tactical, you said. Nothing really is, is further away from tactical in the terms of, of folding knives than something that takes two hands to open. So how about the loud and fun Openel number 12 Explorer? <laughs> Makes me smile right here. 55 bucks for this, so you can almost get two for your budget. You can dual wield. Uh, four inch blade, 12C27 Sandvik steel, full flat grind. Very utilitarian, very useful uh, blade shape here too. Very brightly colored, big, certainly would make an impression and certainly not at all tactical <laughs> around other folks who may be uh, more tactically inclined. The smart aleck in me would really enjoy, you know, using this, making this my most used thing in said environment. But here, here's a really good option, I think. This is also equipped with a whistle and a cutting hook, 
Uh, and I believe a fire starter too. Yes, right here. Let me make sure I can get that out. These things are a little tricky. I forget how they work. And of course I've got the blade open too. So safety first, right? There we go. You got your ferro rod right there, which can be struck with the spine of this knife. It is nice and crisp enough for those utility needs. Also locking collar, safety, safety first, like I mentioned. You could of course take these elements out if you wanted to clean up the uh, tail end of the handle right there. Not too bad either. Check that out. If you want something that is a two hand opener, check out, we're gonna go from like smallest to, to biggest or, or least to most bodacious. And yes, I am, I'm bringing that word back. Check out maybe the CRKT Fossil. 65 bucks right now, almost a four inch blade, nicely finished, simple steel here, steel here. I believe it's 8CR stainless. Yep, not too, too out of bounds there. Stainless steel handles with a lot of attention paid to the kind of cratering and, and dimpling, shall we say, going on there with G10 overlays on either side. Definitely a statement piece, kind of a fancier feeling piece despite the price tag. Something that CRKT has always done really well, bringing more kind of flair to some of the things that they do. Not across all of their lineup, but they when they do it, they do it really well, such as right here. You've got a frame lock for security. You've got a couple ways to open, one being the blade cutout. You can get several different finger options in there and the flipper tab as well. IKBS ball bearings in the pivot, so it flips great. Very convenient, big, loud, fun, Tactical? I don't think so. Some, some may disagree, but I, I don't think that's very tactical at all in terms of its presentation. Yes, it can flip open quickly, but what is a tactical knife anymore anyway? Like what even is it? Any, any feedback on that, Thomas? Nope. None, none at all. Tactical retreat here. <laughs> uh, another knife that uh, has, has not gotten as much attention in the last few years as it once did and still is worthy of that attention, the Kershaw Natrix, the XL version specifically, the copper handled version specifically, your specificallyest versus some of the other ones. That kind of offers the most wow factor, the most loud factor here. Regular price on this is uh, just under a hundred bucks. Right now, while we're filming this anyway, it's actually on sale for about 60. So you get a pretty good deal uh, for that. 3.7 inch blade, D2 tool steel in this case, stone washed finish, great shape, a little bit unconventional, still very useful, but definitely something that, you know, makes, makes the eye turn just a little bit going like, hmm, what's going on over there? There it is, full flat grind, very, like I said, still very utilitarian. It's kind of modified Warncliffe style of utility, works great. Kershaw's sub frame locks, you've got the frame lock sized locking bar here anchored into the copper there on the back that provides your lockup ball bearings in the pivot here with great flipping action and that blade fuller allows you to open it with your thumb like so and you should also be able to reverse flick it someone can apparently it's not me i've done it before why can't i I've not your mileage may vary of course, still a very cool knife in any case. Uh, next up, big pocket cleavers. As a genre, uh, I don't think of at all as being a tactical style of thing, but they are big and loud and fun. Check out the Artisan Cutlery Osprey for one option. Uh, this is one of the more premium ones I'm holding here. Normal price on this uh, with titanium handles and S35VN steel is about 187, but there are D2 and G10 versions of this knife uh, for about 65. We just didn't have any uh, on filming day right here. It's a very unconventional shape. One might even go far as to say an ungraceful shape going on, but certainly fun still. You can definitely cut with this, but it is kind of a, a for fun blade shape in my opinion. At least this one here especially has always struck me thus. But the frame lock here works well and the deployment action here with the ball bearings and the pivot works just fine. Not a hugely oversized handle, unlike the, uh, the blade, which is a bit oversized, 
still makes an impression in your pocket too. It's gonna to be not quite as easy to carry, but still fun. Uh, another you know, more budget priced pocket cleaver you could check out is the Civivi Mastodon. 3.8 inches on the blade here. Uh, on What was it on that artisan? About uh, three and three quarters there. But 3.8 in this case, 9CR series stainless with a stone washed finish. Full flat grind here, fairly slicey blade all things considered. You can see it's not too thick. It's gonna be a decent cutter when you need it to be. And because you've got essentially a clipped leading edge, you have a very acute tip for smaller, pointier work as well. Plenty of handle length, G10 for uh, the material in this case. And I think the red is the loudest, funnest version that's currently available. We have a liner lock here for security. And instead of ball bearings in the pivot, we've got washers in this case, which can be a little more stable when encountering dust and dirt, but you do have a different flipping feel. And this one needs a little bit more kind of wrist than a, uh, a ball bearing system might, at least until it gets broken in. And then finally, the reason I'm looking at pocket cleavers in the first place for this. My, my initial very first answer in my own head for this question when I was reading it is the Kaiser Sheepdog XL. This knife at this size is quite frankly unnecessary, but that's why we love it. No joke. $99 for this knife. 3.9 inch 154 cm blade. If you want to stay under that uh, that 99 or that under that hundred dollar price point, those are your materials. G10 handles, ball bearings in the pivot, liner lock, massive blade that flips. Honestly, way better than it has any right to. I mean, it's not slow. It's quick. It's snappy. It sounds great. Ninety nine bucks. Fun, loud borderline obnoxious. They don't have any brighter colors the, than this right now under the $100 mark. Unfortunately, we can't have everything, can we? I hope that helps. I hope you get to be fun and loud in your new gig. And above all, thank you for your service as well. Definitely. Now we come to our lightning round for today. First question is from Robert Fee. Why do Bowie knives have such a large cutout slash choil area between the edge and the handle? Always wondered, but never been able to find an answer. I know what you're talking about. Check out this Cold Steel Laredo Bowie right here. You're talking about this area around the Ricasso here. Not technically a, a finger choil and definitely not historically the reason for it. It's not something that's typically meant to choke up on for work. It is simply because a Bowie knife, one of its primary purposes is thrusting. And when thrusting, there is a chance your blade could get lodged in your target, whatever that target may be. And so this area is provided so that while kind of maintaining the primary hold on your knife without having to, to really adjust your grip too much, you can hook your finger up in there to give yourself a little extra leverage to pull out of said target. It should be said that the area provided on this Laredo buoy is actually a little bit on the smaller side, um, especially when you take the size of my fingers into account. I'm kind of touching that back edge right there. I don't like that very much. Other buoys out there um, that typically use this usually will provide a little bit more space because at least as I was uh, taught it, as I have been led to understand it, that's the primary reason for that right there. Because as much as we like to use Bowie knives nowadays for any old thing, let's not forget that the original purpose of these was it's a fighting thing, an offensive thing. So hope that helps. Next question is from user RJ5HZ2BB8H. I guess the others were taken. <laughs> Hi there. I love my only one knife, the bug out so much, but I lost it. Can you recommend a really slicey knife that is affordable? My money condition is not that good for the moment. Thank you. Yeah, check out, uh, first of all, we have a uh, episode of our Beat the Icon series on the bug out. You can check out a lot of different options there. But a knife has come out since we did that video that definitely needs to be uh, kind of mentioned as a bug out competitor, and that is the Kershaw Heist, as a budget bug out competitor, I should say. Price on it is like 55 bucks. Let's see, yeah, 54.95 right now. And look at it there next to the bug out. 
overall length and blade length, virtually identical. The blade height is taller on the heist, as you can see, but check out the blade stock thickness there. Almost exactly the same, similar heights to the flat grinds on these two knives. The bug out is actually a little bit higher, but not by much. Very cool. This heist is going to maintain a lot of the same slicey characteristics that you know and love from the bug out. You've got the crossbar locks, so you've got the same kind of action going on. Full length liners on this knife, unlike the bug out. So a little more stable. I know some folks don't like the uh, flexiness of the bug out handles. You have a little bit more rigidity here. And the weight, it's about one ounce heavier than the bug out, but at less than three ounces, it's still a very light knife. Deep carry clip, reversible, great action, great price, D2 tool steel. This is, in my opinion, even more than the, uh, the SOG Terminus XR, which was my previous kind of go-to budget bug out alternative. This one right here is the one to beat for that specific scenario at the very least. Well, now we come to our final question for the episode, which is of course our most serious question. And this is res in response to last week's most serious question where I made a peanut butter sandwich. You guys remember that? Today, Eric Extraordinary 2980 asks, or even states really, I would hate to see how you make a potato and leek soup. Kind of know how he's gonna do it. Let it simmer. Cover and let simmer, yes. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Keep leaving your questions down below, including your most serious questions, I'm taking recipe suggestions as well. Leave them down there in the comments. If you wanna get your hands on any of the things on the table here in front of you, excepting of course the potatoes, the milk, and the pot, check the links in the description, which will take you to knifecenter.com of course, where thanks to our Knife Rewards program, you can earn up to 5% back on your purchases towards a future knife, which is a pretty cool thing indeed. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center, and that's Thomas behind the camera. We're signing off. See you next time.